Good afternoon, and welcome to Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Thanks for joining us today while we explore science and why science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. Today, I have in the studio with me Dr. Leland Warden. Welcome, Leland. Thank you. Good to have you here. Leland is a postdoctoral fellow at Lion Arboretum, part of the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and he is a restoration ecologist, I guess is, your, is sort of your title. So tell us what a restoration ecologist does. Yeah, so restoration ecology is a really enormous field, um, but the concept is that you're coming in and um, basically restoring an ecosystem that has been dam damaged, degraded, or destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is to try to bring back function um, that can be species um, or also just ecosystem services of that ecosystem. Um, and specifically, I work on uh, tropical forest um, restoration um, in both wet and dry forests. Um, Great. I mean, that's got to be challenging because the more, the more we learn about ecosystems, the more we realize these are incredibly complex systems with thousands and thousands of interacting parts, some of which are absolutely crucial to the functioning of other parts, right? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's basically just trying to put all these pieces together. Um, and one of the really cool things about restoration is that um, there's so many steps involved that you really have to take a holistic approach where you understand so how a seed germinates and whether or not that species is suitable for the soil type. And there's a lot of things, but it's true. It's, a, it's very complex, and, um, but really fun to work in because you get to do a lot of different things. True, and it must be, it must be a real uh, time element, too, because when you're restoring particular trees and things, you can't bring in adult trees. You, you do have to bring in the seeds or seedlings. Yeah, and start, start with them and know that it's still going to be decades before you've really restored that ecosystem, right? Right, yeah. And it can be much faster um, in certain systems. But yes, in forests, it's, we like to think in terms of decades and centuries rather than just a couple of years. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you've, you've been, you've, uh, were, you said you did your graduate work at, uh, in Minnesota? Yeah, the University of Minnesota, Minnesota. Twin e Cities. Excellent. But you were, you were at that point working down in Costa Rica a lot. Yeah, so um, I specifically for my doctorate worked on restoring tropical dry forests in northwestern Costa Rica okay. um, and in this pretty incredible conservation area called the Área de Conservación Guanacaste. I think we um, have a, an image, right? Yeah, so the first slide shows um, in northwestern okay. Costa Rica, um, basically the green um, segment is the protected area. And I worked in kind of the north um, or in the southwestern corner of that, there's a little anvil in the corner called Horizontes, which is the experimental forest. Um, and what's really incredible about this system is that um, about 80% of the forest has naturally regenerated after just removing some pressures such as um, unnatural grazers, as uh, cows, and then actually um, restricting um, non-just naturally occurring fires. Mm -hmm. um, but there are areas, about 20% of this uh, protected area, that really needs to take an active restoration approach by planting trees because of soil degradation and other things. Um, so that was what I focused on specifically. Excellent. Now, a lot of people, when they think of tropical forests, they think of rainforests because that's sort of, your, that's sort of the image we all like yeah. got from movies and books and all of, of these heavily green, monstrous canopies dripping moisture down on us. But there are tropical dry forests. Yeah, so dry forest is this really incredible ecosystem. It's also almost 50% of all tropical forests are dry forests um, uh, globally. So in a tropical dry forest, um, half of the year, typically, although it's a range of kind of six to eight months, is completely dry, so no rain whatsoever. Um, and then um, that results in there being a lot of deciduous species generally, although there's a whole range of dry forests too. Um, but it's very different, like in the wet season, it can actually look really very similar to a wet forest. But sometimes in the dry season, especially where I work, it looks like a desert. So um, also in Hawaii, there's quite a few dry forests, but um, people typically, you're right, don't think about the fact that this is a really critically um, important ecosystem. Um, right. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's important because these, these are part, you know, the, the ecosystems don't exist in isolation, right? They're all connected to the ecosystems next to them and all. And so everything that's happening in one is impacting the other. Either species are flowing out or species are flowing in, right? Absolutely. So it, it's, very, it's a very systemic sort of uh, approach you have to be taking. Yeah, and especially um, on, in, there can be a wide range of ecosystems that really exist in such a, in a very small 
um, land area. So especially on the Hawaiian Islands, you can go from dry forest right on the coast, coast and then up to the mountains, it becomes much wetter. Where I work, there's four meters of rain a year, but down in Waikiki, there's about half a meter. So right. all those ecosystems are very connected and sometimes can occur just in that tiny little area. So it's good to think about how they interface. Yeah. Right. And, and these days, there, there's, I mean, there's a ton of pressures on these ecosystems, right? I mean, not only there's pressures from urban growth and all, but, but there are, as you point out, grazers, there's agricultural pressures on them. Uh, there are people cutting them down. And plus, then, there's sort of the big overarching one, right, of, of changing climates, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, where I work, a lot of that, basically, the pressures were agriculture. And mm -hmm. the reason that we're able to restore on a large scale there is because a lot of the um, production of agriculture products, which was mostly beef, has actually moved over to China. So that is a success story in the fact that we're able to now restore that land. But mm -hmm. there are a lot of places, um, even think about prairies in the Midwestern United States that have this tiny little area now because of agricultural pressures, but we don't really have the ability just because of human land use to restore those systems. Um, but it's good to just think about wherever we possibly can to try to um, reforest or bring back ecosystems that did persist in the past um, if that land is available, if humans aren't actually using it. Right. There's, a, there's an increasing recognition, I think, of, of what are sometimes called ecosystem services, right? And a recognition that these wild places on Earth are actually providing things that we actually value besides just sort of a peaceful, serene, pretty environment, right? right. Uh, they're actually giving us potentially all kinds of valuable products. Yeah, and there can be, um, in a lot of times we can just think about decreasing runoff and look, thinking about water filtration. Um, but even in um, natural forests, you can think about actually harvesting of ag of products, um, forest products such as selective harvesting of wood. And there's a lot of ways that we can actually sustainably use ecosystems mm -hmm. um, rather than just completely replacing them um, with for agricultural or other uses, even though that is absolutely necessary um, to sustain our really incredibly skyrocketing uh, global population. Um, but there are some ways, such as agroforestry, where we could actually think about transitioning systems that were, are purely um, agricultural over to hybrids, where we do have um, forest products and ag as well. Right, right. And particularly on, on small islands, this the sort of mix of uses becomes really critical because there's just not, not that much land, right? Yeah. Uh, whereas in Costa Rica, where you're working, it was essentially a, a, a continental scale, right? I mean, right, you have a lot more space. Even right. though it's a very still kind of like postage stamp size country, right. it's, you have a lot more space to actually do this kind of work. Yeah. Right, right. So, um, so you were working there, so, so, so what really brought you here? And what, what are you going to be? trying to do here in Hawaii? Yeah, so um, I started working about a year ago with the new director of Lion Arboretum, Zach Sahawi, and he works primarily in Costa Rica. So I continued on my work there and then work with him in wet forests now. Um, but I'm actually starting up some new projects, um, collaborating with the Hawaiian Rear Plant Program at Lion Arboretum, um, where I'm going to be looking at the outcomes of rare and endangered or threatened and endangered Hawaiian plant reintroductions. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of leveraging my, leveraging my expertise in um, understanding of soil science and how plants respond to stress um, to try to really get at um, successes and failures in reintroductions and try to help um, get an idea of basically all of the outcomes that have occurred um, and then also try to help to make some recommendations to improve those, restorate, those reintroductions. Excellent. Because I, I understand, yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of variables in this. The, the mountains here on Oahu, which are, have a lot of invasive species in them now, and it's estimated if, if we could restore those to something like the original or quasi-original uh, uh, ecosystem, we would get a tremendous amount less runoff from that forest, tremendous amount more water soaking in, and we'd be essentially replenishing our aquifers at a much higher rate then, right? Yeah, especially because a lot of the I mean, invasive tree species here, such as strawberry guava, are really short-statured, and you don't actually have that structure that you would as in, you, from a really a native Hawaiian um, wet forest. Mm -hmm. um, so 
There's a lot to think about in terms of scoring on a really large scale. Um, the plant reintroduction world is actually usually a much smaller scale, and a lot of it is just trying to preserve the genetic material and all of the really incredible native species that we have here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm working more on a really kind of almost individual plant scale or even mm -hmm. population scale, but then the goal would be to use those general principles to then scale up, um, mm -hmm. which is always the goal to do landscape scale, scale restoration. Um, mm -hmm. And that kind of nests in with a lot of these really large scale global initiatives that uh, have been developed recently to restore uh, millions of hectares of, of um, forests and other ecosystems. Right, but so a lot of it is, is that lion you'll take and, and set up a small plot somewhere and start trying to encourage the growth of some particular species that, that is extremely rare and exactly. begin to get more of them around so you can then start taking them out and planting them elsewhere and get m multiple populations going, right? Yeah, and they're also just to look at all of the incredible work that's been done on um, the whole archipelago because people have been introducing, reintroducing an endangered species for many years now and they've had some really great successes and some challenges too. So really just synthesizing all that information um, which people have been working on to try to actually think about general principles for doing those reintroductions would be, uh -huh. is really great. That's great. Yeah. It hadn't occurred to me that, yeah, if people have been doing this, it would be great to synthesize that knowledge because they're, they're, you should be able to learn from the mistakes of others, right? Absolutely. And their successes, right? Yeah, excellent, excellent. That's, um, and this is certainly Hawaii, well, we may be one of the hot spots for invasive species, as it were, but you said in Costa Rica, but there are other places around the world, right, where, where the same kind of thing, and not just the tropics, up in the temperate zones too, right? Yeah, um, I actually started uh, my work in, in science actually on understanding how an understory invasive species was impacting forest growth. So there's a species called garlic mustard that is really just a pretty um, small uh, ground cover species that actually would come and really modify nutrient cycling. So invasive species are a problem globally um, and it, they can really impact lots of, different, lots of different systems. Aquatic systems are massively impacted by invasive species too. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I grew up in Florida and there were the water hyacinths which were introduced for whatever reason and gradually took over many bodies of water there, and then the famous one in Florida, of course, is the kudzu, right, that was brought yeah. in in the 1930s as a cattle feed and has turned into sort of a green blanket over much mm -hmm. of the state. <laughs> I mean, in cases like that, is there, are there people trying to deal with those, I mean, that, that level of devastation to a natural ecosystem? And, and if so, what, what are they doing sort of, sort of, you know, taking everything out and denuding it all? Yeah, um, so I kind of work peripherally on invasive species, mm -hmm. but I can comment just generally. So I, I think there's a lot of removal programs and mm -hmm. that um, has worked really well in certain cases, but a lot of um, systems in, I know of recent work in Hawaii where people are actually thinking about how to plant native species that actually persist well with those invasives. So sometimes it's actually, we need to recognize that we have novel ecosystems or systems that we can't just Kind of notch back to exactly what they used to be before and just recognize that um, we can actually design systems that um, will bring back some of this native diversity but we may not be able to just totally take out all of the, the invasive stuff yeah well that, no that's great and very, very timely sort of speaking of turning back the clock we are going to have to uh, take a quick break here uh, Leland Worden, uh, Lion Arboretum, is with me here today. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, on Likeable Science. We'll take a one-minute break, and then we'll see you then. Aloha, I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Tim Apicella. We are hosts here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks, Thanks so, so much. much. Aloha, this is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. 
We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome uh, studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. Welcome back to Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the Think Tech studio is Dr. Leland uh, Worden uh, from the Lion Arboretum. And Leland and I were talking in the first half of the show about, about some of the work he's done, uh, some issues in uh, forest, tropical dry forest restoration and all. And we had actually mentioned earlier that a lot of people don't particularly understand what sort of tropical dry forest is and what it looks like. And I remember that you, you had sent me some good photos. Yeah, so we can go to the next slide here. Um, so basically, this is um, one of my field sites, and this is a very degraded soil type called a vertisol. Um, and this is the forest that we actually sat to restore. Um, and this is about 20 years of regrowth here. So you can see that there's really not much there. Right, it doesn't um, look like a forest. <laughs> yeah, so basically our idea was to try to, first of all, decide what species can really grow here because we don't really have a good reference ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, and another challenge, you can go to the next slide here, um, is that these uh, soils flood a lot in the wet season. So mm -hmm. we have this really shrink and swell cycle of this really high um, clay content soil where they crack when it's dry and then flood when it's wet. So this is another thing we really were trying to understand is how to pick species for this like, challenging environment. Yeah, yeah. Because, as you say, you can't turn the clock back, so you've got to deal with the, the ongoing changes. And, yeah. And that must, uh, you don't know if species A really is going to go with species B, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so we set out and actually started with 40 species, which of about 160 species in this ecosystem, spe tree species total is a lot. Um, actually, we can go to the next slide here. Um, and basically planted them all out in a nursery and then tried to pick the best species out of 32 um, that could persist. So, so what, when you say best, what do you mean best? Um, so <laughs> specifically, we're looking at survivorship, survival okay. and growth. So okay. whether or not, because this is a pretty short time period that we're working with, I, mm. over a PhD, you have a limited time. Right. So I'm still monitoring this experiment, but over two years, what had the highest growth and what actually survived? Okay, because yeah. all those were sort of native species, so it was just sort of some kind of exactly. crap just to, uh, you know, hey, let's, let's go with whatever is going good, right? Yeah, and we tried a little bit with actually adding things to the soil to increase drainage, mm -hmm. um, and that, in the end, helped for initial survival, but didn't really do anything in the long term. So we mm -hmm. found that it's really, the species identity, that's the most important thing. Um, okay. Yeah. So well, great. So, so that, that, that's going on, and, and you, you figure this will, uh, the work you started, these trees now are growing up and have turned from those little six inch, one foot things into. They're getting, they're getting bigger, yeah. Huh. We have, uh, so we took that kind of the ideas from that initial experiment and then planted out six fill hectares, which is mm -hmm. about 17 acres. Okay. Um, each one of them approximately football field by a football field. So mm -hmm. to try to then answer some more management style questions on um, what we, can we do with uh, existing vegetation. Um, so we do have trees that are about three meters tall at this point. So I'm actually going back in a month um, to do a full survey of all the, about 4,500 that we planted in that experiment. Um, so I'll see, I have to give an update on how tall they are at that point, oh. yeah. <laughs> excellent, excellent. It, yeah, it is something we, a lot of people don't get to appreciate is to watch watch a tree really grow over uh, years and years and years, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, it's it is exciting. So, uh, uh, and you're going to sort of take this same approach on a modified in a modified way into your, your work here. But uh, do we have another slide or two of your Costa Rica work? That I see. Yeah. Uh, so if we go to the next slide and the next two, actually, I just wanted to highlight the fact that all this work is done in collaboration with restoration practitioners. So we really try to use, uh, do all of our work um, working with people that do this stuff on the ground. So mm -hmm. science doesn't exist in a total vacuum. Right. We really need to think about how to apply our questions on a large scale. Um, so these are images of all the people that helped me plant out, but also right. just helped me plant all of, or design all the experiments. So we worked 
Totally, completely together, working um, to think about initial questions through the final outcomes and developing our best practices. Right, those images don't look like what people think about as doing science, right? But, yeah. <laughs> but these people had, had you collaboratively, you had sat there with them and figured out what, what do they need here, what's likely to grow here, what, what will we like to see grow, what we know probably isn't going to grow well here. Exactly. And made all those calculations and then you start digging in the dirt, right? Yeah. <laughs> Lots of digging holes and then um, huh? I mean, watching plants grow, but yeah. the digging yeah. holes takes a lot of time. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, it's a necessary part. Uh, it's, that's the way science proceeds, right? It's just uh, one experiment at a time, one, one, little, one little day in that yep. case, sort of one, one seedling plant at a, at a time. Exactly. And excellent. excellent. So uh, looking a little bit forward, what do you see as some of the big challenges in ecosystem restoration? Are you hopeful for the field? I mean, do you think... Seems to me there's a lot of ecosystems being degraded very rapidly in, at, at this point in time, and uh, we're in a bit of a, a sort of a race, as it were. Yeah. So as much of as the challenges still really do exist, um, there have been these really incredible global um, scale restoration projects. Um, started with the Bond Challenge, developed by the United Nations, to basically get uh, countries to pledge to restore millions of hectares of forests by 2030. Um, and at this point many of these countries have already actually restored lots of forests. So it's happening. Um, it's really, and actually I'll highlight Brazil as a real success story where they've actually developed, kind of changed their economy over a bit to have restoration be very important in terms of getting carbon credits, but then also they have the infrastructure for people just being able to buy seedlings. So they have really large scale production nurseries that allow this to be push forward. So we have to actually think about within our current um, both political and economic climate how to make these things happen and when countries really commit to doing this work it, it, it happens. So we need to actually um, think about talking to the people that really think about policy the most because to do things on a large scale you really have to work at that level. Right, and it has to really then take into account the sort of cultural norms, social norms, economic issues, Absolutely. Uh, development, uh, because they, they can't, the country can't turn over a bunch of land if they're going to suddenly have a bunch of people moving into that land, right? Yeah, so the people are honestly the most important. So right. I care a lot about plants, and right. I think about plants all the time, and would love to just go and walk in a forest all day. But in the end, you really need to think about how doing restoration impacts people and how it benefits people, and um, really pitching it in that way is kind of the, the way that my work is headed, yeah. Yeah, I mean, more and more it seems this sort of idea that people have of these sort of pristine ecosystems untouched by human beings is sort of a myth at this point. I mean, virtually, I don't want to say virtually every, but huge amounts of the terrestrial landscape have been impacted in some way or another by human activity, right? Yeah. And, and there are relatively few spots that you could truly call pristine and untouched now. Yeah, and humans uh -huh. have been impacting right. ecosystems for hundreds of thousands of years. Right, so right. Um, it's, it's better to really think about that component as being just part of how the, wor the world works. Right. How, yeah. how we can work with the ecosystems, make them uh, a, a vital part of our economic well-being, right? So that you don't, you don't just burn them down, they're gone. You, you say you know, it's our best economic interest to have a, a sustained forest going here, and that's going to allow us to sell the agricultural products from it or bring the tourists in to see it or capture CO2 to right. mitigate climate change. It, exactly. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's a very, uh, it's a truly multidisciplinary uh, approach that you're, you're having to take, right? Yeah. You, you, as, as you pointed out earlier, you, you're collaborating with the actual practitioners on the ground, but at the same time, you have to be talking to, as you said, the policymakers, the, uh, you know, the economists probably, literally, uh, and you know, the developers, the urban planners, all these people, right, have, have sort of a finger in, in the pot. Yeah, and that's honestly the hardest part is actually connecting uh, my science with policy. And I've, um, I think about this a lot, and I'm trying to do more of that kind of work, um, and a lot of people are, but it's really difficult to actually just saw a really great talk um, by Dr. Robin Chasden, um, where she was really saying it's hard to get a seat at the table, so it's really hard to um, integrate real um, on the ground science with what policy is getting implemented, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of venues that, and nonprofits that are working on, on making that happen now. 
Yeah, it's, it's necessary on, I think, far beyond actually the realm of ecosystem restoration to have, uh, have policies, governmental policies based on science and scientific evidence. Uh, it, it's sort of fool, foolish and foolhardy not to do so. Uh, one can get in big trouble by ignoring the science. And the science typically, while it's not in any sense a silver bullet or a panacea, it, it's an incredibly vital part of the information, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and your, your ecosystem rest restoration is probably one of the clearest examples of that. You can't do that work without a good scientific knowledge of what could possibly work, what, what is working, right? Yeah, and like you said, just a knowledge of what is happening in terms of human use of all those systems. And I um, have talked with farmers about trying to actually plant trees on their land, and there's a whole other host of concerns in terms of taking away economic viability and turning that to restoration. So they're... Mm -hmm. We really need to think about um, doing things like agroforestry, where we can plant um, some agricultural products with trees and do kind of hybrid, hybrid ecosystem work at this point to make sure that everyone gets what they need. Yeah. Right, yeah, and that's, of course, actually, you're in a wonderful area of the world for seeing agroforestry because a lot of the smaller islands in particular are, have to do that by, they're pushed into it. So in the marshals, where they're just these tiny little sandbars, basically, yeah, they're growing everything you know together with the trees and the yeah. uh, the root crops and everything uh, all uh, jowl as it were. Yeah, there's really amazing work that's that has continued on on yeah. the Hawaiian Islands working with agroforestry stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's truly wonderful stuff, and it's it's great to see enthusiastic, articulate, intelligent people like yourself doing this kind of work. And much needed. Um, so I, I guess, do you have a, a 10 seconds of advice for students coming up? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, find what you love. I mean, the most important thing, honestly, is just knowing what you don't like to do. And then at that point, um, it's finding something that you're passionate about is really the most important. And there's benefits and drawbacks to everything, but I have found a part where most of the time and most of my day, I'm very happy about what I'm doing, and I get to be outside, and it's a challenge constantly, um, but tinkering and answering questions about natural systems is super fun. Cool. Yeah. Well, well, we thank you for coming on and sharing all your knowledge here, and thank you for what you're doing, doing to the planet here. Uh, Leland Weirden, uh, Lion, Lion Arboretum, has been with us today here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. We hope you'll come back next week and uh, be here again. Until then. <laughs>